London, 1858. Death and disease stalked the Thames. Raw sewage was dumped straight into the river, which became a brown sludge. And the smell was terrible. Back in the supposedly genteel Victorian era, going to the loo was rather more indiscriminate than today. Few houses had a water closet installed. Gentlemen took matters into their own hands when the need took them. Ladies with a full bladder also had to improvise, but more discreetly. The Victorians were so frightened and afraid of discussing anything to do with bodily fluids that it held back an awful lot of sanitation developments. It prevented people from properly discussing what should be done with sanitary problems with sewers, even prevented many people from wanting a water closet or even a bath or a wash basin in the first place. So this sort of reserve held back sanitation developments. Lavatory technology is pretty well as old as civilization. We found stone-built lavatories from as far back as 4000 BC on the islands of Orkney, uh, a settlement called Skara Bray. That was a, a Neolithic settlement, and then in 1700 BC, King Minos of Crete proved himself an excremental visionary. Why? Because he had the first designer loo in history, a lovely wooden seat and flushing water as well. King Minos and the Greeks handed the sanitary baton to the Romans, who then created toilets for all the citizens. When the Romans came to Britain in AD 43, they brought with them not only their civilization, but also their sanitation. In fact, you can still see today the ruins at Hadrian's Wall of the latrines they laid out at a place called Housestead's Fort. What better after a busy day defending the empire than to sit down together and defecate? They solved the problem of where you have a concentration of a lot of people living in one small area, the whole place after a while starts to stink. They built special communal use latrines. Underneath the stone seats were channels through which the stream was diverted through them to wash them out. There was another little channel in front of the users. They had short wooden sticks with a sponge wrapped on one end and you would dabble the stick with the sponge in the water, clean yourself with it and then put it back for the next person. And it's said from that we get the expression to get hold of the wrong end of the stick. The Romans left Britain in around AD 410 and they took their sanitary engineering with them. The Saxons, well, they were none too choosy in their lavatorial habits. Londoners happily reverted to type. God, I you could be fined for chucking your slops out of the window like that. But thanks to the Normans, there was a French warning you could shout out, Garde Lou, literally translated, watch out for the water, and actually the origin of the word Lou. One other thing, what was the real reason a gentleman was meant to walk on the outside of a pavement and a lady on the inside? Well, it was because a gentleman, if he really was that, would be prepared to get the projectiles in the neck when they came out of the window and protect his fair lady. Until late Victorian times, the street remained a public convenience. Sherborne Lane in East London was a favourite. It was commonly known as Shitebourne Lane. You had to make use of any facility that you could find in, if you needed to go to the loo. So it would have been, from that point of view, um, very, very um, smelly in certain parts of the, of the city. When it was raining, the rainwater would carry away the waste down to the riverside. It would flow down these open channels to the river. London's polluted streams and rivers fed the city's waste into the Thames. The fleet, the Tyburn, Stamford Brook became sewers. And as the city spread, these ancient rivers were gradually covered over to flow underground. Well, for many hundreds of years, almost the only sanitary facilities as such were cesspools. The cesspools were emptied by gong firmers. They were men who would arrive at night 
with a horse-drawn cart called a honey cart. And of course, in the built-up areas, frequently the whole lot had to be carried in buckets straight through the middle of people's houses. Cesspools were a lucrative business for the gong firmers. They were not only well paid by house owners to remove the waste, but it was then transported out of London and sold to farmers as manure at a profit. London grew rapidly. In 1700, it had a population of only half a million, but the Industrial Revolution created a mass migration to the city for jobs. By 1850, there were two and a half million Londoners. The gong firmers charged more because they had to travel further to dispose of the waste. Landlords dispensed of their services. More sewage was left to fester in the cesspools. Speculative builders erected the back-to-back -back houses and tenements for the poor. There were no mod cons. The cesspools and privies overflowed. There was no central organized plan for how to dispose of human effluent. It was all a further strain on London's already chaotic drainage system. A sanitary reformer, Hector Gavin, investigated the conditions of the poor in Bethnal Green, East London. On entering number 23 Shacklewell Street, the smell was most offensive and was compared to that from a common vault in which the dead had long been retained. It seemed to me to arise from some foul drain below the floor of the house. It is scarcely possible to conceive the utter degradation of the human mind which permits the disgusting offensiveness of the abominable nuisance of common privies. No one man can really be credited with inventing the loo. It developed over hundreds or even arguably thousands of years. But the closest we get to an inventor is Sir John Harrington, who produced his Ajax water closet in 1592. Behind the seat there was a cistern full of water and there was a pipe between the cistern and the pan. And you pulled the plug out and that emptied all the water out of the cistern into the bowl and you pulled another plug out and that emptied everything out of the bowl into a cesspit. So really quite recognisably a water closet. However, sadly, as far as we know, he only made two. One for himself, at his own house at Culston near Bath, and the other one for his godmother, Queen Elizabeth I. And then in 1778, a Yorkshire carpenter called Joseph Brammer patented a new water closet which could be mass-produced. And from the late 18th century onwards, the water closet became a kind of middle-class status symbol. Instead of buying a BMW to impress the neighbours, you bought a water closet and made sure that they used it. George Jennings, who was a great sanitary pioneer of the time, approached Prince Albert and the Royal Commissioners who were constructing the Crystal Palace and the Great Exhibition and offered to build a public convenience for nothing. He built the world's first public loos and had white-coated attendants inside charging one penny for their use. And it's from that we get the story to spend a penny. The Great Exhibition was the final straw because people visiting the Great Exhibition, experiencing the water closet for the first time, went home, installed them in their own homes, and so you have a modern device, the water closet, being attached to what was still basically a medieval sewage disposal system so most of London's underground streams and wells were being polluted by leakage from cesspools and sewers. So a poor person who went and drew water from a well was almost certainly drinking his neighbour's excrement. Londoners continued to draw water from wells which had every chance of being contaminated by leaking cesspools. By the 1850s, water was being piped to the houses of the better off. If anything, this made matters worse. All of London's sewage flowed into the River Thames. The Thames, of course, is a tidal river, so the sewage simply flowed up and down as far as Teddington, which is as far as the tide goes. Six of the water companies had intakes to their waterworks 
on the tidal river. So they were literally drawing in the sewage of, by the middle of the 19th century, two and a half million people and piping it into their homes. With reputations and profits at stake, the water companies vigorously defended the quality of their supplies. Dr. Pearson of the Grand Junction Water Company proclaimed the elevating properties of Thames water. The impregnating ingredients of the Thames are as perfectly harmless as any spring water of the purest kind in common life. Indeed, there is probably not a spring with the exception of the Malvern, so pure as Thames water. The cholera bacterium arrived from India in 1831, killing more than 6,000 in the first outbreak. 1848, catastrophe strikes London. A cholera epidemic sweeps through the congested city, killing more than 14,000. Two out of three people who contracted cholera died. Communities on both sides of the river were hit. The spread was rapid and deadly. In Bermondsey, South London, one person in 30 perished. The hospitals were full of shrieking and dying victims with no prospect of relief or cure. Three years later, another outbreak occurs, claiming an additional 10,000 victims. The most advanced city in the world faced conditions that had not been seen since the Black Death of the Middle Ages. Whilst there was agreement on the problem, there was a lot of misinformation about the spread of cholera. The most popular explanation among politicians was the so-called miasma theory. This held that cholera was actually spread by smell. That is, if you could smell the bad air, you would catch cholera. And the story of cholera's eradication, and if you like, the end of the disinformation of miasma, was the story of two people, John Snow, a GP, and Joseph Baselgate, an engineer. Ironically, while Snow's surgery was on Frith Street and Baselgate's office was on Greek Street, both within yards of each other in Soho, they never actually met. Snow's contribution was in his research into contamination of the drinking water supply. Famously, he studied the outbreak of cholera in the area around Golden Square in Soho. And through meticulous interviews, he mapped the incidence of cholera and isolated the cause to the Broad Street water pump. The pump had clearly been contaminated by a nearby cesspool under a house. And keep in mind, almost every house had a cesspool in its basement at the time. His research was actually very clear, but he had very little luck with the politicians of the day who found the likely cause and his explanation rather too unpalatable. So he ended up approaching the local parish council. Despite the seeming anomaly of the local monastery being unaffected, um, they actually mainly drank the beer they brewed, which they brewed with water from a, from a different pump. Um, the parish council nevertheless agreed and Snow personally removed the handle from the Broad Street pump the cholera cleared up almost immediately. Meanwhile, Joseph Baselgate was working as a civil servant, becoming the chief engineer of the Metropolitan Board of Works. For years, he made detailed proposals to the government of the day to construct a new and far more robust system of sewers. Every time he was turned down based on the miasma theory, or guess what, it cost too much. The turning point actually came in 1858, when London experienced one of its worst heat waves. And quite simply, the stench of the river was too strong for the MPs, and they began to refuse to turn up to Parliament for fear of suffocation or, of course, contracting cholera through smell.
Such was the level of desperation that within a matter of three days in July of that year, the bill to build London's sewer system was passed through a much depleted parliament. would revolutionize urban planning. He and thousands of city workers would build the most advanced sewer system to date. Basil Jett's innovative plan was to install giant intercepting sewers on each side of the Thames, running parallel to the water. These main pipes would be connected to more than 1,300 miles of older city sewers, collecting the waste and diverting it away from the river. When gravity wasn't enough to carry the flow, Bazaljet built grand pumping stations. Their large steam-driven engines lifted the sewage until gravity could take over once again. The sewers guided the waste into two deep reservoirs, where it would be stored and released at high tide, when nature could dispose of it neatly. No one had doubted the connection between cholera and sewage, but only Dr. John Snow had understood exactly how they were connected. Like many others, I've always believed in the miasma theory. That disease was carried by smell. Now I realize I was wrong. That Dr. Snow was correct. Cholera is waterborne. And yet, since the sewers were built, the cholera has died out, and everywhere public health has improved. I thought the sewers were helping because they removed the stench, the pestilence, and therefore the disease. That was our priority. Purification of the water was always secondary. Yet that is what has made a difference to my fellow citizens. This, then, is the supreme irony of Bazalgette's story. He had built his sewers when almost everyone believed the miasma theory, his aim simply to take away the smell. But by also removing the sewage, he had accidentally ensured that future generations of Londoners would be safe from the deadly disease. He had saved the city. If the malignant spirits, whom we moderns call cholera, typhus and smallpox, were to set out in quest of the man who has been their deadliest foe in all London, they would make their way to the home of Joseph Bazalgette. The accuracy of John Snow's observations was fully vindicated. Cholera is a water-borne disease. But tragically, he never lived to see his theory accepted. By the time he was proved right, Jon Snow had been dead for eight years. The effectiveness of Basil Jett's great work was proven for all on July 26, 1867. That night, the equivalent of two months' average rainfall fell upon London. Bazalgette sewers coped with every last drop. The final section of the sewer system was the Thames Embankment, a mammoth engineering project in its own right. It housed both the northern low-level sewer and the Metropolitan Underground Railway. And in time, the embankments would help to create a faster-flowing, cleaner river. And if it's all working as it should, no one would even think. No one would even think. When he'd finished with the sewers, Bazalgette turned his attention to London itself. His bridges spanned the river at Putney, Battersea and Hammersmith. He replaced narrow streets with broad boulevards. He laid out parks right across the metropolis. As much as any man, Joseph Bazalgette made modern London. As for cholera, it never returned after Bazalgette's sewers were completed.
we can only guess at how many lives he saved. Similar clean-up operations have taken place in other major cities around the world. Yet, 150 years since the Great Stink, in the developing world, billions of people are living and dying in the kind of squalor that was eradicated long ago in the rich world. 2.6 billion people lack access to basic sanitation, and over 1 billion lack access to clean water. There is a global crisis in sanitation and water, and it undermines all development efforts. The stink goes on.